Hey guys, how are you? How are you? Good to see you. Captain Ron, what's happening, man? You're the captain. All right. The internet connection looks good. In Jesus' name, may it stay strong for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm starting another new series. Najib. What's up, Carly? What it is? Steven Universe. Universe is yours. I'm starting another series. I've started multiple series that... In due course, in due time, Lord Jesus willing, if he keeps me around and if the Lord Jesus tarries, I will finish all these series. Jesus, not the Archangel Michael. The deity of Jesus Christ in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then <clears throat> the other series that I started, Trinity in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We'll look at intertestamental literature, Jewish sources written after the Old Testament, before the New Testament to see how the Jews understood the Old Testament and whether they saw a plurality of divine persons, God willing. And then, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, by the power of the Holy Spirit, giving me wisdom and knowledge, understanding and the ability and holiness and purity and a worshipful spirit to love my God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'll be doing expository preaching where we'll go through a book of the Bible and break it down chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And what I want to start with is the gospel of john ml don't start it here don't tell me your voice sounds much more professional because you're not going to last long and i'm going to become very unprofessional and i'm going to throw you out of my chat you're not complimenting me you're insulting me all right good to see everyone marcy good to see you saint leora all the regulars nick nikki jason sam shimon does psalm 45 6. Uh, yes, it does, Nikki Jessen, but you'd have to unpack it. You'd have to go in depth on it to show how it points to two divine persons, one of whom is also human. So Psalm 45 is not simply an affirmation that there are two divine persons in the Godhead, but that one of those persons is also a man. He's the God-man, right? So pray for me. Pray that God will save me miraculously this coming month. I'm completely free by the blood of Jesus, completely free by the power of the Holy Spirit from all these shackles and constraints, and that God will fully provide for my needs, stand on my feet to take care of my daughters, so I can devote myself entirely to the work of the Lord until Jesus calls me, until it's my time to die or Jesus descends. And I'm hoping the Lord returns sooner than later under one condition, that we are sealed by the Spirit, washed in the blood of Jesus, purified in the blood of Jesus, so that we can meet him, right? You know, there are times in which I feel I, you know, I, Lord, take me now. What's the point? Because you don't need me. He doesn't need me. I need him. Yeah, praise God, Aiden. I finally got to talk to my daughters last Friday. It was amazing. I reconnected with them and reaffirmed them and reassured them that after Jesus Christ, first Jesus is my God, my Lord, my love, my life. And after Jesus, they are my heart on earth. And that I'll be with them and I'll never leave them. They just have to pray and be patient. And so they were excited to know that their Baba loves them, will never leave them, even though they were sad that they couldn't hug me. So glory to God for that. And we're in contact now. The only problem is, is that their mother tried to chime in the conversation because I'm noticing she's trying to get my attention for good or worse, even though I ignored her and I can't have any contact with her. It was clear from the conversation their mother is not happy. She's not. She realizes what she did, but she is too proud and stubborn to repent. Pray God's spirit will convict her and break her to repent and turn away from all these immoral relationships and live purely for Jesus. So she needs to repent. As long as she has a man in her life, those men become band-aids because she looks to a man for her comfort. Pray God will remove all that comfort that is false and satanic until she hits rock bottom and truly cries out to Christ and save, be saved. Until that happens, she's always going to find that's been her pattern. And I'm not trying to slander. This is the truth before the Lord. Her way of coping with misery is to find a man to fill her need, but no man can. No man can. And until she realizes that, there's nothing I can do for her. I can't, right? You know what insanity is? Let me tell you what insanity is. Of course, Hebrews 
That's a given. You do not marry someone who's not sold out for Jesus, who doesn't love Jesus more than anything, more than you, and loves the same Jesus you love. Of course. All right. Folks, you know what insanity is? Let me just tell you what insanity is. Repeating the same pattern over and over again and expecting a different result. But because we're fallen, we're tainted, we're corrupted by sin and influenced by Satan, if not controlled by Satan, that's what we do. We keep repeating the same insane pattern. And this is why I pray for her. Her name is Michelle. Pray for her. And in Jesus' name, pray that God will remove that man in her life. Because another man is now taking care of my kids against my will, not something I want. So, guys, can you commit and praying and fasting that Jesus will remove this man? His name is Martin. Remove Martin and every man from my children's lives and protect them because I'm their Baba. I want to be in their life. Could you guys covenant with me and pray for that? His name is Martin. Pray the Lord get him out of the picture and convict her that men cannot bring her happiness and she should not be bringing men into my children's lives. Please covenant with me for the sake of my two angels, for their sake, right? For their sake, you know, that they'll be protected. And guys, I just want you to know, uh, Sahih Christian here, he's actually one of my best friends and a brother from my heart. Do pray for him. I'm not given permission to share any of his details, but all I can tell you is, he too needs Jesus Christ to bless him, watch over him, and bless his children. Pray for Sai Christian. Pray for his children. God will bless his children, protect them. He's a dear brother. I love this guy. You know, I, I, in fact, it's because I love him that I tolerate him. Because there's one, there's one guy in this world that drives me nuts. It's him. The guy makes me want to lose my testimony. There have been times where I've been in the car where I wanted to jump out of the car while I was driving. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Okay, well, that said, are we ready to begin? Yeah. Oh, forget it. This guy makes David Wood look like a choir boy. Or is it a choir girl? Right? The dude knows how to be a nuisance. And then he justifies himself. Hey, man, don't hate me because I'm telling you the truth. I'm not going to tickle yours. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And he does it in such a gracious and loving manner. It just makes you feel so good. So good that you want to throw yourself from your car and to oncoming traffic, All right? Nikki, come on. You guys really are serious when you ask me if David and I are friends? Let me tell you something about David Wood and I. Satan has tried over and over again to separate us, but the bond from the Holy Spirit between us, the blood of Jesus that washes us, is unbreakable, inseparable. God brought him into my life and brought me into his life because God is using him, and I hope he's using me, to destroy Islam and magnify Christ. I am David's brother till I die. And I will <clears throat> do all I can to make sure that the Lord will use him mightily and his family and bless them. And he's one of the few people that I can tell you, and I mean this, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I mean this. He's one of the few people that I die for. I die for that guy, right? I love that man. Uh, even though we banter and we mock each other and we go back and forth, he is truly a modern day. What, what, what's the analogy? He's a he's actually David, his namesake, a namesake. David, the prophet, he's a warrior like David, and he has one of the most brilliant minds. He thinks like a general. He's like General Patton of Christianity. General Patton of Christianity. He is a brilliant mind. His strategies are amazing. And he doesn't care what the cost is. He doesn't care if it costs him his life, even the life of his family, because he is on a mission by the grace of God to make sure Islam is destroyed so Muslims get saved and Christians are strengthened. And he's also a beast against atheism. Another brother that I love from my heart, passionately and I die for by the power of the Holy Spirit only by the power of the Holy Spirit I can die for anyone apart from the spirit I'm a coward is Anthony Rogers Anthony Rogers pray for him and his family he's got some issues that are just hindering him not any when I say issues I'm talking about like medical issues and so forth then again I'll let him share if he wants to 
Pray God will keep his family healthy and provide for them and set him free to do ministry because he's a beast. He's a theological beast. And what makes him scary is not, it's not that simply he can eat up atheism or he can eat up Islam. He is a genius when it comes to biblical theology. That man knows his Bible and loves his Bible. All right? That man knows his Bible and loves his Bible because he loves Jesus. He's an amazing man. With that said, are we guys ready to get in the saddle? Right? And I hate the fact that I am now live streaming while our precious sister, Hatun Tash, who's the female Paul. If there was a female Paul, it's Hatun Tash. And actually, let me touch another one. But she's busy taking care of the home front, doing everything necessary to make it possible for David to do ministry. David's wife, David Wood. Uh, his wife, David Wood's wife, Marie. I consider those two women female Pauls, Paulas or Paulinas. They're amazing women. I can tell you, David would not be the apologist he is if he didn't have the wife that he had. He truly has been blessed by the Lord with such an amazing godly woman who loves Jesus from her heart. And in spite of all the issues that she's gone through, she's a soldier who loves the Lord and has a positive outlook. And I know because I've stayed at their place for a couple of weeks. She's an amazing woman. Hatun Tash is a warrior. Hatun Tash is a female Paul. They're amazing. They're amazing women. David doesn't know how blessed he is to have such a woman because look at my case, even the case of my brother Vocab alone. And there are other men of God in apologetics and in ministry who have unfaithful wives who are being used of Satan to try to destroy their ministries and destroy them. And you know, it's a testimony, folks. It's a testimony to the glory of our God, to how real Jesus is, how almighty Jesus is, how alive he is. That we can go through what we went through and still stand and glorify him. I'm telling you, had it not been for the spirit sealing me for Christ, you would not see me in social media. I'd have been gone. I'd have been in jail. What I've been tempted with, what the devil has done through my ex-wife and her infidelity, would have driven someone else who didn't have the grace of God's spirit preserving him to jail. Right? Right? I am a testimony that Jesus truly is faithful to his, his body, his church, truly. If Jesus loves you, and he does, he will keep you. That's how I know Jesus loves me. He's in love with me, and I don't deserve it. And that's, an, that's a sign for the rest of you. He loves you and is in love with you and will fight for you and will preserve you. Have no doubt. I'm being honest. I'm a testimony. Uh, Sai Christian can tell you. He's been a witness to to what I've gone through. Sai Christian, can you confirm, had it not been Jesus Christ and the Spirit preserving me for Christ, I would have been in jail because of what I've gone through? Even you. Even him. Right? Praise God, Angela. May he bless your husband and fill him for the glory of Christ. In time, I'll share when I'm completely de delivered. See, Sai Christian, read what he just posted. Read what he posted. Violence would have happened for sure. He is absolutely right. What we've been tempted with, what these women have done to us, had it not been for the Holy Spirit. And again, I want to just say thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving us from ourselves and our own flesh from the temptation of Satan and not allowing us to succumb to the flesh. Never allow us to succumb to the flesh so that we never shame you because you are worthy of all praise. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. So with that said, let's again ask the Father to bless this session. Father, we ask for the sake of your son, the Lord Jesus. Bless this session, Abba. Bless this session. Fill us, not just me, everyone here with your Holy Spirit, with your presence. And Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, guide my words. Save me from error, stammering, and confusion, and misinterpretation. And to recall the scriptures perfectly and interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus. And purify our motives 
Father, wash our hearts and the intention of our hearts, our, our entire beings. Wash us thoroughly in the blood of the Lamb, your Son, the Lord Jesus. Make us pure in your sight, Father. And may Jesus Christ increase in us and sit and throne upon our hearts forever. And the hearts of our loved ones, my daughters, may the hearts of my daughters be the eternal throne of Jesus who loves them. For their sake, Father, fight for me. For their sake, save me. Deliver me from this corrupt legal system and protect me for your glory. You don't need me. We need you and depend on you. And bless everyone here, Father, with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit. Use me to bless them and to show, show them how to use even the Jehovah Witness Bible to bring you glory, to glorify your son as Jehovah in the flesh and the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. We need you, Father. We need the Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us. Give us the holiness to delight your heart and the purity <clears throat> to cause you to just rejoice over us, your people, purchased by the blood of your Son, sealed by your Spirit. And help us to know your word more perfectly and live it out more powerfully and to love it passionately. Because to love your word is to love you. Because the Bible, your word is your voice. And enslave us to your voice, Father. To the voice of the Lord Jesus, the Good Shepherd. To the voice of your Spirit. And teach us, Lord. And set us free. Set us free from Satan. Set us free from the world. Set us free from our flesh. And those who have offended us or attacked us or hurt us or sought to destroy us. And I'm speaking sp specifically of Mike's wife, who's still the mother of my children. Have mercy on them. Convict them. Let the Holy Spirit be a fire in their bones and their heart. A fire consuming them until they repent truly and turn to the Lord Jesus and be saved. Have mercy on them, Father. Have mercy on them, Lord Jesus. Have mercy on them, Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us. We love you. Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, Son, Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 As I was saying... I don't like to do a live stream when we have other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, right, going live. I know my sister Hatuna has, is live streaming, and I don't mean to compete. We're not in competition. We're all brothers and sisters fighting in the same army by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we want to encourage each other. But again, it's not something I plan. And until I can get internet in my own place in a couple of weeks, I have to make... Uh, take advantage of every opportunity that I can go live. So God bless her and her work. If you guys want to hear about Islam, go to her channel. She's now live streaming. But if you want to hear about how to use the Joe Witness Bible against them to show that even in their perverted Bible, God is the Trinity and Jesus is God in the flesh with hopes that they'll get saved, then stick around. In fact, for this session, guess what I did? I went to the local Joe Witness Kingdom Hall and I got a brand new 2013 revised edition of the Jehovah Witnesses. Here you go. Brand new. I went to the King of All today just for you guys. Because I'm here to serve you for the sake of Jesus. And I love you for the sake of Jesus. Even though I love you imperfectly. You know, only God can love you perfectly. I went there to get it to show you. you what you do, you don't buy this. You go to the local Kingdom Hall, and they'll give it to you free of charge. Here they gave me a brand new 2013 revised edition of the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. In a wrap. It's still wrapped. And I'm going to open it right now. See, I said I'm going to wait and open it. And they give it for free. Here's what amazes me. Here's a false organization, an organization used of the devil that produce some of the best quality magazines, pamphlets, and booklets, and has one of the most beautiful websites, one of the most professional-looking websites, right? All in their service to a false god that they think is the true god. Now, that, that should humble us. Folks, look at how beautiful and professional this Bible is. And they give it away free of charge. Guys, here you have an organization that has about over 8 million worldwide. They're so zealous for this false God, whom they think is the God of the Bible, and for this false gospel, that they're willing to pump millions, if not billions of dollars, to produce some of the best-looking, best-quality Bibles, 
magazines, pamphlets, booklets, who've actually produced one of the best looking, one of the most professional websites online. Now, folks, that should convict us. If these false Christians are so zealous to put that much money, that amount of dollars for their product and their zeal for a God that doesn't exist, how much more should we be zealous to do all we can with all our resources, especially financially, for the true God who loves us? Right? If enough Christians take that to heart, then ministries like mine and vocabs and others would be fully financed and supported so we wouldn't have to worry financially. But God is good and he provides, right? So here you go, free of charge. How many churches, you know, would give you a free Bible? Right? They would, I'm sure. But you know what I'm saying? Look at it. Wow. And guys, do you notice the size? Do you know why it's this small? Just to tell you how zealous they are, just to tell you how zealous they are, the reason why it's small, it's a pocket size so it can fit into your purse or your bag for ministry. See, they produced it this size so you can take it with you on the field to do ministry. Did you know that? Look how zealous they are for this false God and false gospel, right? Uh, Tippy Bear, I know you meant it well, but it came out wrong. That God provided a false gospel to expose the lies. The way you worded it, it said, I'm preaching a false gospel. But I understand, you know, you're just who you are and you can say what you want. You mean one thing, but you come out saying something else. Okay? Sorry, Tippy. We forgive you for that. <laughs> it didn't come out right, right? Hey, Sam, God has provided you with a false gospel so you can expose the lies. <laughs> Oh, that was funny. All right. So here it is. Now, let me get you the link, link to their online website. Okay, because we're going to be using their material. JW.org, but here's the link. Look at, again, the things they make available for free. Okay, here. Click on that link. There you have their online Bibles free of charge. No, Nikki, uh... I can't answer your question. I don't know why in the world you'd be confused. I haven't even said anything yet. Okay. If you if you go, if you go to this link, here's the link again, and I'll post it, post it in the description box when I'm done. There is the link to all the online Bibles they make available free of charge. If you guys take a moment, because I'm preparing you for the series, click on it. They don't just make available the various editions of their Bible perversion. Click on it, you'll see. New World Translation, Holy Scriptures, Study Edition. New World Translation, Holy Scriptures, 2013 Revision, the one I held in my hand. New World Translation, Holy Scriptures, 1984 Edition. Here's why I love this. They also make available the Kingdom Interlinear Translation of the Greek Scriptures. They make available their own Greek Interlinear of the New Testament, which is... They invite you to look at to compare their translation with. It's right there, folks. And along that, they also provide the American Standard Version, the Bible Living English, and King James Version. Are you guys catching it? Here's the link again. I posted it now the third time. Yeah. You see that? So now, if you catch it, you'll see what an excellent resource that they've made available free of charge that's why you have to praise the triumph god for modern technology that we use it for the glory of christ and use it lawfully not to sin against the lord but to glorify the lord because not right now because the internet you can go to their website and check out all their bible versions and use their own resources to glorify jesus as jehovah and we're going to be looking at their own Greek interlinear, where their own Greek interlinear exposes their deliberate perversion of the Bible. Here's what's ironic. They make available the Greek interlinear. You'll see the Greek of the New Testament that they use, the Westcott and Hort text, and the English translation of the Greek words. And then to the right, you'll see their translation, and you'll see often 
Their translation doesn't agree with the interlinear. God blessed them by bringing them to the true God, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He won't bless them if they're worshiping a false God and preaching a false gospel. Right? So that's the link. Now, I want to again talk about how brutally honest they are in respect to textual criticism. What do I mean by that? Obviously, they're deceivers and they're deceived by Satan. But what do I mean by that? Folks, follow with me. It's not going to be as entertaining today, but it's going to be educational. Because what the Joe's Witnesses do is they follow current scholarship on the Bible. Follow with me. Make sure you're getting this. Make sure I'm not confusing you because this is where, right? This is where I'm going to need you to give me your undivided attention so you can learn. Because you want me to teach you how to use their Bible to witness to Joe's Witnesses, right? That's what you want. Right? Guys, if you see Arabian and Umberto Nunes acting stupid and acting up, being used of the devil, send them on their merry way. This channel is not for them. Okay, so follow with me. This is where I need you to pay attention. One thing about the society is they read the scholarly literature produced by evangelicals, Catholics, Orthodox, and they read the scholarly literature by textual critics of the Bible, New Testament textual critics critics, right? So for example, they'll read Bart Ehrman. They'll read Daniel Wallace and they'll read what they have to say about the transmission of the Bible, its preservation and variant readings. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because I want to show you something. Here's the link to the NIV translation to Mark 16 verses 9 to 20. Now, here, it starts at Mark 16, verse 8, because if I don't put Mark 16, verse 8 to 20, you won't see the note. Here's what I want you to see. Okay, guys, here's the link. Please click on it. Here's the New International Version of the Holy Bible, translation produced by evangelical scholars working with also Catholic Jews, right, who claim to believe in the inerrancy, inspiration of the Bible. Click on it. Notice what they say about Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. Number one, notice they have something in brackets, and then they posted verses 9 to 20 in italics. It's italicized, italics. Click on it so you can see, okay? Click on it, guys, please. I need you to follow me. Don't let the children devil distract you because then you won't learn. That's what you're going to see. In the NIV, they provide those comments in brackets. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. So in other words, they're calling into question Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, causing you to doubt whether Mark actually wrote this by inspiration. And once there's doubt in your heart regarding these verses, you won't have confidence quoting them as the words of God. Okay, so then here's the question. Why do translations like NIV or the New American Standard Bible or English Standard Version or other translations that also doubt Mark 16, 9 to 20, why do they include them? Why not just omit them? Because they don't believe that verses 9 to 20 were written by Mark under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They believe they were added later. These scholars and these versions believe that Mark ends at Mark 16, verse 8. It ends there. Mark 16, verse 8. Okay? See, Protestant is too excited, so he jumps the gun. Doesn't wait for me to get to my point. So I got to fire this guy. Okay, Mark 16, verse 8. Do you know why most of these translations hesitate to omit verses 9 to 20? Do you know why? Do you know why they don't omit the verses? They still leave them there but put a note indicating that they doubt that these verses are part of the original gospel of Mark written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? No, no, not because that's the of Christ. It's because they know that people who've been raised on the King James Bible and are used to Mark 16, 9 to 20 being cited as scripture, once they notice that Mark 16 ends at 8, they're going to throw that Bible out. And they're going to say it's corrupt. You understand? So what are they doing? 
they're slowly desensitizing you, slowly over time, getting you to the point of agreeing with them that Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 are not part of what Mark wrote, so that in time, if the Lord tarries, future Bibles will no longer include them. But they can't do it right now. You with me there? They can't do it right now. The reason why they can't do it right now, think about it, folks. If you've been used to the King James Bible and you've been used to reading Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and even preaching from those verses as Scripture, I give you an IV, and you look at in the NIV, and Mark 16 ends at verse 8, you're going to say, hey, what happened to verses 9 to 20? Why aren't they in this Bible? This Bible's corrupt. Get rid of it. You catch it? And I'm not selling you on the King James. I'm just telling you a fact. I'm telling you a fact. And here's where you find the New World Translation is more honest. You know why? As my friend Protestant, who was too excited, couldn't wait. Here, let me show you what the society does. Mark 16 and their translation. I'll give you the link. Guess what, folks? Mark 16 ends at 8 in their version. At least they're being more honest in that because they too don't believe that verses 9 and 20 were written by Mark. Guess what they do? They don't include them in their translation. Here you go. Click on it. Guys, click on it and see where Mark 16 ends in the New World Translation. Check it out. And ends at verse 8. There is no 9 to 20. Now they have an asterisk where you click and it tells you check the appendix and they have a discussion in the appendix why 9 and 20 are not part of Mark. Mark 16. Do you see it? You guys clicking on it? Now, who's being more honest and faithful to their conviction? Let me repeat again. Who's being more honest and faithful to their conviction? If you believe Mark 16, 9 and 20 are not scripture, why then do you still include them in your translation? Why not omit them? Who's being more honest here? No, King of Kings, you're still not getting it. See, you're not getting it either, King of Kings. Let me try it again. The New World Translation of the Joe's Witnesses. Joe's Witnesses are convinced by scholars like Daniel Wallace. Mark 16, 9 to 20 are not part of what Mark wrote. So they omit them. Why include them? So what do you mean they're deceit? You're not getting it, king of kings. Who's being more honest to what they believe? The society that says we're not going to include 16, 9 to 20 because scholarship says Mark didn't write this. They're spurious, so why include them? Or your NIV, your ESV, your NET that still includes them, though they don't believe that Mark wrote 16, 9 to 20. So you're not getting it. So who's being more honest with the evidence? I'm not saying they're right. Okay, now let me show you what these notes don't tell you. I wrote this in. Here's my Bible. This is my personal Bible. This is the one I use, the King James Version. And I want to study God's Word. This is the one I use. Okay, now I left my a note in Mark 16. Let me tell you how misleading the NIV note is. First class, can you repost it? Okay. Here, let me give you a note. And I'm going to tell you who you need to read to give you a more balanced view of the evidence, one that will convince you Mark 16, 9 to 20 is part of what Mark wrote. It's part of the original gospel of Mark written by inspiration. Here's what the NIV note didn't tell you. Post it again, the NIV note for Mark 16, 9 to 20, first last. Hello, earth calling first last. What do you mean which one? Judith. Hello. All right. There, okay. Yeah. Read the note again. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. Here's what they didn't tell you. 99. Here's my note. And Mark, pay attention, guys. I need you to listen. Okay. Here it is. 99.5% of existing manuscripts contain Mark 16, 9 to 20. 99.5% of the manuscripts of Mark 16 
have verses 9 to 20. Let me repeat, 99.5% of the manuscripts. That's over 1,600 manuscripts that include it, such as Codices A, D, and W, and Irenaeus. Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp, who's a disciple of John. Irenaeus, around the year 180 AD, quotes Mark 16, verse 19, as being written by Mark. When they tell you the two earliest manuscripts, they're talking about Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and they are not the best or most accurate. You see how misleading that note was? It didn't give you all this information. Do you know where I got this information? You know where I got this information? Thank the Lord for Christian scholars like James E. Snap Jr., He's been on one of my previous live streams. James Snap, S-N-A-P-P. -P. Find his YouTube channel. Find his online blog. And he's got two eBooks on Amazon.com providing the overwhelming textual evidence proving that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is genuine. Mark did write it by inspiration, and the evidence shows he did. And also proving that John 7, 53 to 8, 11, the story of the woman caught in adultery, that too is genuine scripture written by John. He gives you the other side of the evidence that scholars like Daniel Wallace and Bart Ehrman do not give you. You with me there? So if you ask me, do I believe that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is part of the original gospel of Mark written by inspiration? Absolutely. Do I believe that the story of the woman caught in adultery that's found in John chapter 7, verses 53 to 811. That too is genuine scripture written by John under inspiration of the Spirit. Absolutely. But up until I discovered the other side of the story, the other side of the evidence by James Knapp and others like him, I had doubts regarding John 7, 53 to 811, and Mark 16, 9 to 20. So thank God for people like James Knapp. Jonathan Sheffield, the dear brother in the Lord that you'll find on Facebook, who's got a YouTube page and has done videos. People like them who give us the other side of the story to give us a more balanced view of the evidence so that we're not deceived by such notes. Do you know that? Such notes like the NIV to mislead you. Oh, but here's another one. Here's another one. You ready for the other one? See, this is all part of this series. I'm starting this series. Here now, the story of the woman caught in adultery. The story of the woman caught into adultery. Uh, jumping like a monkey. Nabil Qureshi was wrong there. He's now in glory in the presence of Jesus. And he was influenced by a particular brand of scholarship because he looked up to people like Mike Lacona, Daniel Wallace, and others all of whom hold the view that Mark 16 ends at verse 8. So they're wrong, and Nebu Qureshi was wrong in that regard. That's not an attack. It's just he was misled because they mislead people, and I'm not saying they do it deliberately, right? I'm not saying they have evil motives. They've convinced themselves that Mark 16 ends at verse 8. Now, folks, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Click on this. Click on that link. Click on that link. Okay. Click on that link. Notice the note of the NIV again. Notice the note of the NIV again. Did you catch it? Here's the NIV. Notice the note, folks. Okay. The earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53 to 8, 11. A few manuscripts include these verses, holy or in part, after John 7, 36 or John 21, 25, Luke 21, 38, and Luke, or Luke 24, 53. One of the most misleading and dishonest notes you'll ever read. Those manuscripts where this story is found after John 7, 36 or 
John 21, 25 or Luke 21, 38 or Luke 24, 53. They don't tell you. These are later manuscripts that come from centuries after the Gospel of John in the medieval period. That they don't tell you. They give you the impression that this is a floating story found in some of the earliest witnesses. Misleading. Now, because I believe this type of scholarship, for the longest time I hesitated and was afraid to quote the story of the woman caught in adultery. Did you know that? Because I was influenced and I looked up to the scholarship of Daniel Wallace and even our brother James White. I used to hesitate because of these notes. Thank God again for people like James Snap. James Snap, Snap has videos on his YouTube channel and an ebook on John 7, 53, 8, 11, demolishing these claims, showing that these claims are misleading and dishonest. Okay, but now let me show you what Daniel Wallace says about this. Here is a post by Daniel Wallace. Notice what the post is titled. Look what he says. My favorite passage that's not in the Bible. He thinks he's being cute and funny. And again, I don't, I'm not attacking the man. I met him. I love the guy. Very down to earth. But he thinks he's being cute and funny. You know what that means? My favorite passage that's not in the Bible. He's saying, my favorite story is the woman caught in adultery, but it's not part of the Bible. See, he's already told you this story is not part of the Bible. It was an oral tradition that was floating around. And then later on, someone inserted it in the Gospel of John where we find it today, but it's not written by John. And Daniel Wallace is considered one of the leading, if not the leading, evangelical scholar of the New Testament text. So now you're not a scholar. I'm not a scholar. Daniel Wallace is an evangelical Christian. And so you're going to trust him, right? And again, he is a, he's a beautiful guy, loves the Lord, right? But his views are off, and he doesn't give you the full story. Not because he's being dishonest. It just simply, for whatever reason, doesn't give you the full story. But if you have an evangelical scholar that you trust because he's a Trinitarian, he says he believes in the Bible, and write something like this, my favorite passage that's not in the Bible, what is that going to do to your confidence in this story? James Snap has challenged Daniel Wallace to have a discussion, but Daniel Wallace won't discuss with Snap. James Snap is also challenged to discuss this with James White. Okay. Now, when, and when a Christian that you trust, okay, a Christian that you trust, who is an evangelical Trinitarian, says he believes the Bible is inspired and errant, tells you this story of the woman in adultery, it's not in the Bible. Sh shouldn't be in the Bible. Will you have confidence quoting that as the word of God? Will you have confidence quoting Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 as the word of God? So now here's my question, Hebrews 1.8. Don't ask me about 1 John 5.7 now. Please stay focused, Hebrews 1.8. Focus on this because I'm trying to make a point. Don't ask me about these other variant readings. Okay. That's why for many years I hesitated to quote the story of the woman caught in adultery and Mark 16, 9 to 20. Because I had doubts about its genuineness, but thank God no more. I'm now convinced they are genuine scripture inspired by the Spirit through Mark and John. Now, feel now follow me. Now, since Daniel Wallace just told you this passage is not in the Bible, since the NIV notes just told you that this is a questionable passage that shouldn't be in the Gospel of John, let me again. Ask the question that I asked about Mark 16, 9 to 20. Here's my question. Why then do they still include it in their Bibles? Why are they still including? Yes, TBI James, he is. Because he doesn't think that they're qualified on his level. Yeah, that's true. I have to tell you. Yeah, there's some arrogance and pride there. But now listen to what I'm asking you. Listen to what I'm asking you. Since the NIV translators... ES, ESV translators, New American Standard Bible translators, they don't, they don't believe these passages are genuine scripture. Why do they still include them in their Bibles? And it's not just the NIV. Let me show you the note to the ESV. Okay. 
Let me show you the note to the ESV. Here you go. ESV. Look how misleading the ESV is. Look how short and misleading the note is. Here's the link, guys. Please click on the links. I want you to read it for yourself. Now watch here. Look. Look at the note. Look what it says. Look. The earliest manuscripts do not include 753.811. Now you're not a scholar. You're buying the ESV because you believe this is God's perfect words in English and you trust it and you trust the translators because they're men of God and you go there and you read this. Whoa. The earliest manuscripts don't have this? So then why is it in my Bible? So you know why they can't remove them? Because, folks, you've been raised, let's say, on the King James Bible. Not so much this generation. Because you've been raised on the King James Bible, you're used to finding John 7, 53 to 8, 11 about the woman in adultery. And that story moved you, even maybe to tears, how amazing Jesus is in his love and compassion, even for women who have been immoral, that he wants to forgive them, not condemn them. And it moved you to tears, the heart of our Lord, that he came to save sinners, came to save adulterers, the sexually immoral, not condemn them if they would only turn to him. And you're like, how beautiful are you, O son of God? Compassionate, merciful, and loving. There's hope for me. And then you read this note. Wait. This story probably never took place. The encounter between the adulterous woman and Jesus may have never took, taken place because according to these notes, John didn't write this. So where did it come from? So they know they can't simply omit them because you've been raised on the King James. You're used to these passages being considered scripture. So guess what? They have to slowly over time prepare you for the omission of these passages. In fact, Daniel Wallace has gone on record. He wants to remove John 7, 53, 8, 11 from the New English translation because he was part of that translation. He provided textual critical notes. And he hopes that in future editions of the New English translation, it will be removed. It shouldn't be there. So they can't remove them because if you're used to the King James and you pick up that the, uh, the ESV and says, this shouldn't be there. What? If they had omitted that entire section. If I picked up ESV and John 7, 15, 8, 11 was gone, corrupt Bible, throw it out. So what they do is they're preparing future generations for Bibles that will no longer have those verses. You understand what they're doing? They can't do it now because there'll be such a negative reaction by Christians that these Bibles won't sell anymore. But they're indoctrinating you. They're preparing you so that now you get used to questioning their authenticity, right? Doubting whether these are actually part of what God originally inspired so that by the time the next generation after you <clears throat> grows up and starts reading the Bible, they're already used to questioning these passages. Oh, okay, no problem. You see what's happening? But now let's look at the Jehovah Witnesses. Watch here. This is all tied into the discussion, folks. If you're wondering, I thought it's about the Jehovah Witness Bible. It is, but I'm preparing you. Okay. Here, the Jehovah Witness Bible. Folks, click. Guys, click. Guess where John 8 starts in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Click on it. Did you notice what's missing in their Bible? There is no verses 111. It starts at verse 12. The Jehovah Witness Bible starts at John 8, verse 12. They've omitted the story of the woman caught in adultery. Did you catch it? Here it is. Here's the link. Don't take my word for it. Tony, click on the link. That's their Bible. I have it right here. They start John at verse 12. Verses 111, they omitted. 
Angela, again, you're not getting it. Did you guys click and see? You guys are still not getting it. They're not being wicked. They're being more honest than these Bible versions produced by evangelicals. Why? Because the evangelicals are telling you John 8 verses 111 shouldn't be there, but they don't have the courage to omit them. So the Jehovah's Witness is saying, oh, so you're saying these are not inspired? Then we're not going to include them in our Bible. So who's being more honest with the evidence? See, guys, you're still not getting it. Thank you, first and last. Let me repeat what first and last just said. In other words, they are brave enough to follow through the logic of the scholarship. Thank you. They're being more honest. They're saying, okay, wait, Daniel Wallace, even Bart Ehrman, you're telling us these verses were not written by John or Mark? Then we're not going to include them in our Bible. We only want those verses that the Holy Spirit inspired. So who's being more honest? Who's being more honest? Now, does it trouble you that you have translations by evangelical scholars that don't believe Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 should be in the Gospel of Mark and don't believe the story of the woman caught in adultery should be in the Gospel of John, but still include them anyway? You with me there? You see? This is the kind of scholarship that's actually destroying faith, not building faith. It is. This is the type of scholarship that led Bart Ehrman to lose faith in the Bible. He lost faith in the Bible. Right? You with me there? And this wasn't to try to sell you on the King James or anything, but I'm just letting you know. These are facts. They're out there. I haven't looked at the Latin Vulgate because that's the official translation for the Roman Catholic Church. But I know the Greek Orthodox Church, Russo, follow the Byzantine manuscripts. So the Greek Orthodox Church do believe John 7, 53 to 8, 11, and Mark 16, verses 9 to 20 are genuine scripture inspired by the Spirit because they follow what's known as the Byzantine manuscripts. The New King James Version, for the most part, also follows the Byzantine manuscripts, the majority text from which we get the King James. But the New King James also has those notes. They have those notes. Let me hear. Let me show you. Let me see. Let me double check. And we're almost ready to begin. So this is why this is part one. I'm preparing you for what's to come if you're okay with it. I'm here to try to educate you to the best of my ability, trusting the Spirit to save me from error and sensationalism, and speak the truth boldly and in love for the glory of Christ. That's my trust in the Spirit that he'll accomplish that through me to bless you. Let's see. Let's see. Yep, they have a note here. See? Here you go. This is the problem with the New King James Version. They have the critical notes. Here, do me a favor, folks. Here's the New King James Version. Let me click on, give you the link again. Please, you have to click on it. When you click on it, you're going to see in brackets. You see number 53? In brackets, the letter B. Click on B, and this is what you're going to read. Huh? Okay. This is what you find. NU, NU is the words Nestle Alan, Greek, critical Greek text, and United Bible Society's critical Greek text. Brackets 753 through 811 as not in the original text. They are present in over 900 manuscripts of John. So they're telling you over 900 manuscripts of John have it, but the Nessel Alan critical Greek text and the United Bible Society's critical Greek text put it in brackets as not being part of the original. You see that? Now let me show you what they say about the longer ending of Mark. Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. So it's not the Muslims that you need to worry about. It's your own scholars you need to worry about. Worry about them. Here you go, folks. Again, if you go here, 
It's your evangelical scholars that you need to be scared of. Go there. Click there. You're going to see in brackets the letter A by verse 9. Here's what you find. Okay? Look what it is. Here it is. Here's what you find. Watch here. Verses 9 to 20 are bracketed in NU, Nestle Alan, and United Bible Society's critical Greek editions, as not in the original text. They are lacking in Codex Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus, although nearly all other manuscripts of Mark contain them. See, now that's a more balanced note. They're telling you nearly all other manuscripts of Mark that have Mark 16 have the longer ending. It's Sinaiticus and Vaticanus that don't. Yeah, like I said, the New King James Version, Ruth, is based on what's known as the majority text. That's the, the line of New Testament manuscripts from which we get the received text, Textus Receptus, which the King James was based upon. No, it's okay, George. You're helping me. You don't need to be sorry. We're not there to know why they were omitted in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And there are some people who make a strong argument that Sinaiticus is a forgery. It's actually a forgery. It's not ancient. What's my point? Forget about Sinaiticus and forget Vaticanus. Throw them in the trash bin. Even though you have scholars like Daniel Wallace, even James White, whom I love, you know, swear by these manuscripts, right? To me, get rid of them. You don't need them. Don't use them. Don't consult them. And they'll even admit to you, just in the four Gospels alone, between Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, there are over 3,000 differences just in the four Gospels among them, let alone all the corrections done to them by subsequent scribes, right? Yes, they are, Jutlink. They are. And the heirs of Bruce Metzger, who people praise who I could not stand. Bruce Metzger, although he's dead and you're not supposed to talk ill of the dead, was an arrogant jerk. I spoke to him on the phone, and he wasn't as conservative as people think. He didn't believe that Daniel wrote Daniel. He believed that the book of Daniel was a second century BC document that had some traditions that were older. So he also bought into liberal scholarship, and he was an arrogant jerk. Arrogant jerk. Okay? And yet scholars like Danny Wallace swear by him because they consider him the greatest 20th century scholar of the Greek New Testament. Arrogant jerk. I talked to him on the phone. Nasty jerk. Let people condemn me for talking ill of him jerk and his his views did more damage than good i don't think much of ron wyatt's archaeological discoveries anyway with that said what was the point in bringing all of this up to show you that the new world translation it is a perverted bible however it does follow mainstream scholarship on the text of the New Testament. And so it makes the same choices regarding the variant readings that mainstream scholarship on the New Testament make. In other words, their views about the variant readings are closer to the views of Daniel Wallace and Bruce Metzger and others who share the same philosophy regarding the transmission of the Greek New Testament. You with me there? So it's following the same philosophy and method that modern scholars of the Greek New Testament, like Daniel Wallace, even Bart Ehrman, though he's not a believer, he is a scholar of the Greek New Testament, follow, and they make the same decisions and choices regarding variant readings that they do, that they do. So for the most part, they're basing it essentially on the same Greek text, right? The one that was produced by Westcott and Hort and then updated by subsequent scholars like Nestle Alan and others, right? But pretty much, they'll even tell you, the Joe's Witnesses, we base the New Testament on the Greek of the Westcott and Hort, Greek critical text. They'll tell you that. The Joe's Witnesses will tell you that our translation of the New Testament is best on the Greek text edited, collated by Westcott and Hort. 
And if you want to know what Scott and Horner uh, happen to be, Google it, right? So for the most part, the Greek text is a standard text that Daniel Wallace, James White, and others would use with the difference is that they follow modern updating revision of the Westcott and Hort text. But essentially, the Greek that scholars are following today was basically the Greek produced by Westcott and Hort that's gone through subsequent corrections and additions and revisions. Clear? Is that clear? What I just said? So where's the problem with their translation? The problem with their translation is not so much the Greek text that they've chosen to use, even though I have a problem with that Greek text. It's the way they even translate that Greek, because there are times in which they choose to translate the Greek in a manner that goes against other translations, specifically in those verses that have to do with doctrines like the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit, salvation, in order to butcher and obscure what the original languages actually say in those given passages. So everyone clear? Which guy? Everyone with me so far? You understand? I didn't confuse any of you. No, King of Kings, why would you ban him? Okay. Everyone clear or did I confuse you? Number one, did I confuse you? Anyone confused? Anyone confused? This is all warm up. I haven't even gotten into it. All right. Number two, second question. Did I bore you with this? Because I'm here to serve you and I'm trusting the spirit to protect me from error, to help you increase your knowledge, wisdom, understanding of the scriptures. You're bored with this? You're okay so far? Everything good? So you're not excited to now delve into the topic? Oh, and by the way, I also wanted to show you this. In one of my previous sessions, I had said, folks, with scholars like these, who needs enemies? I don't know if you remember in one of my previous sessions. Here's what I said. I said, you have modern evangelical Trinitarian scholars will tell you the Bible's inspired, inerrant, that say that the gospel of John doesn't give you the actual words of Jesus. It's not giving you the historical Jesus. John is giving you an interpretation of what he believes Jesus meant as inspired by the Spirit. Do you remember I told you that? I go, that's what scholars like Mike Lacona, Craig Evans, Daniel Wallace believe. They believe that when you pick up the gospel of John and Jesus says, I and my father are one, Jesus didn't say that. John is telling you that's what Jesus meant, but Jesus never said those words. Remember I said that? Remember? Now, folks, with scholars like that, we don't need Muslims to attack our faith. We don't need atheists to attack our faith. We got our own scholars destroying the faith for us, even though they think they're doing service to God. Now, the reason why I mention that is because I want you to see this book. Okay, this book right here. Honoring the Sun. Watch here. Pay attention. Let me know I'm not confusing you. Honoring the Sun. This is by Larry W. Hurtado. He just passed away this year. He passed away. Larry W. Hurtado was one of the leading pioneers on the early Christian belief in the deity of Christ. He wrote some of the best books looking at the historical data and demonstrating historically that Jesus' first followers, his very own disciples who knew him and walked with him, started worshiping Jesus as God in union with God from the very start of the Christian faith. So he did some outstanding work demonstrating historically on the basis of the historical evidence Jesus' very own eyewitnesses, his own followers who were Jews, started worshiping Jesus in union with God from the very get-go. So he did some outstanding work because that destroys the claims of Muslims and, let's say, liberal critical scholarship 
that the worship of Jesus as God in union with the Father is something later and started among the Gentiles, not Jesus' followers. He demonstrated historically on the evidence of the historical data, the manuscripts, archaeological inscriptions, that it was Jesus' own Jewish followers who started worshiping Jesus as God from the very beginning as being one with the Father. So thank God for his work. But, huh, but wait, 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 wait. Let me read this. What does he believe about the Gospel of John? And what does he believe about the historical Jesus? Did this man believe that the historical Jesus claimed to be God and taught his disciples that he was God? And does, did this man believe that the Gospel of John was actual history giving you the actual words of Jesus? Okay. Page 16 and page 17. Pages 16 and 17. You ready? Can I read this for you? And he claimed to be a conservative evangelical scholar. Are you ready? Are you ready to hear what he believed about the historical Jesus? Did he think that the Jesus of history taught his followers that he was God? And did he believe that the Gospel of John gives you the actual words of Jesus? He's now responding to a scholar named Fletcher Lewis. Fletcher Lewis argued that Jesus himself taught that he was God worthy of worship. What does he say to that? Guys, pay attention. Pages 16 to 17 of his book, Honoring the Son. Pay attention. As attractive as Fletcher Lewis's proposal might be for some theologically, allowing them to base the worship of Jesus on Jesus' own teaching. The reason why they worship Jesus is because Jesus taught them, hey, you need to worship me. That's what Fletcher Lewis taught. What does he say? There are problems that make it dubious on historical grounds. So he's saying there's a problem with that claim. For example, although the Gospel of John features Jesus expressing his heavenly origins and divine status, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not. So it seems to most scholars that the Gospel of John reflects an account of Jesus that is overtly ref refracted through the elevated view of him that erupted in the post-Easter setting. In plain English, you know what he's saying? John is not giving you what Jesus said. John is telling you what he believes Jesus meant after Jesus went to heaven and after the disciples started worshiping him. In other words, you cannot quote the Gospel of John to prove that Jesus himself taught you must worship him because John is not giving you the words of Jesus. That's what he taught. Did you hear what he just said? But wait, let me read the next part. You ready for the next part? Thank you, medic for Christ. Within our own camp, those who claim to love the Trinity, the Bible, claim to be Christians, they're doing greater damage and destruction to our cause in convincing unbelievers of the truth of the gospel. With scholars like these, you don't need Muslims or atheists. But wait, it gets worse. Well, wait, wait, wait. But the major problem is that the earliest Christian texts do not base the worship of Jesus on his instructions or demands but instead on the actions of God in raising Jesus from death and exalting him to heavenly glory. That is, pay attention, these texts justify the worship of Jesus as the obedient response to God's glorification of Jesus of Nazareth and God's requirement that Jesus should be reverenced accordingly. In the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, earliest believers quickly came to ascribe to Jesus a preexistence and an incarnation. They did, not Jesus. They claimed Jesus existed before he became man and then became human. Who? His followers after his resurrection. They claimed that for him. He never claimed it for himself. Now, now watch. But these concepts seem to have been corollaries of their prior conviction that God had raised Jesus from death and designated him as Messiah and Lord. In short, watch here. In short, it is unlikely Guys, pay attention. This is supposedly a conservative. It is unlikely that during his earthly ministry, Jesus taught his disciples that he was the incarnation 
of a pre-existent son word and that he was worthy of worship. Bam. It is unlikely that Jesus taught he's the son of God that came down from heaven, became man, and you must worship him. It is unlikely that Jesus taught this. And he's a conservative. Catch it? Okay. Now, folks, this is why I need you to pray for me. Pray for David Wood, Vocab Malone, Anthony Rogers, and even James White. Because James White, to his credit, will tell you, John is giving you the actual words of Jesus. Did you know that? James White will tell you, you can quote John to tell you what Jesus of history said. Jesus did say, I and my father one. Jesus did say, he who sees me sees the father. So pray for people like James White that God preserves us because we're dealing with people from our own camp. And by the way, this is the view of Mike Lacona. This is the view of Daniel Wallace, the view of Larry Hurtado, and Craig Evans and others. Okay? Pray for me. This is where I need you to pray and fast. Why do you think Satan's attacking us and trying to distract me with an evil, corrupt judge, a whore of the devil? May God chasten her and save me from her so that I can't focus on doing this, be more distracted with these nuisances, with a debt that I did not accrue. I need you guys to fast and pray for me, February 10, 19, to be delivered completely and kept safe for the glory of the Lord to do this work for the glory of Christ. And pray for the provision. Okay? Okay. Now, before now, I begin. This is all part one. This is all introduction. After this, we're going to start the series. Okay? Before I begin, how many of you are upset and angry at what current state of conservative evangelical scholarship is teaching in churches, in seminaries, in colleges? How many of you are upset? How many of you are disgusted? Are disgusted by what they say? But if you speak out against them, if I say, hey, this is what Mike Lacona believes, Danny Wallace, you know what they're going to label me? That I am a troubler of the brethren, causing division and attacking scholars and apologists in the field. Because I'm simply telling you what they believe. And if you ask them, why do you think that John is not giving you the words of Jesus? All because we don't find the same kind of sayings or the same sayings of Jesus and John that we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As if Matthew, Mark, and Luke must quote Jesus saying the exact same things that John quotes Jesus saying for John to be historically reliable. In fact, folks, think how stupid that assumption is. Why then would John even write his gospel if the sayings that he records in his gospel are already mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Why then write another gospel? Obviously, John's purpose is to supplement Matthew, Mark, and Luke to include those sayings that they didn't mention, not because Jesus didn't say it, he did, but for whatever reason, Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't include them. Right. So to say that Mark doesn't mention the same sayings that John does, and I can say since Mark doesn't mention the sayings of, of Jesus and John, that Mark is not reliable. Why automatically John is guilty? Why automatically discount him? Why not say Mark is wrong? After all, church tradition says John was the apostle and eyewitness of Jesus, where Mark wasn't. He was a companion of the apostles. So why not question Mark and affirm John? Because John clearly shows that Jesus is the eternal word, the creator of heaven and earth. We can't give John too much credit. Clear? Yeah. So folks, let me encourage you. Demythologize scholarship. 
Don't make these scholars more than they are and don't sit in awe of them because they are doing more damage. I'm not saying they're doing it deliberately. They're deceived, obviously, because they want the respect of liberal academia of scholarship and be taken serious by the liberals, just like the church in the West wants to be taken serious by the world. So what do they do? They capitulate. They make concessions and compromises to appease the world. All that does is it produces more unbelievers than, un than believers and weakens our ability to impact culture and bring shame to the name of Christ. Right, you know? So don't make them more than they are. Don't be in awe of them because they're a PhD or professor. So what? I'll take your PhD and use it for toilet paper. I don't care about your PhD. In fact, my toilet better paper is better than your PhD. Because if you're going to use your PhD to make such arguments, then what's left, folks? That means our battle is not with outsiders. Our battle is now within those who profess to be of the faith, of the camp of faith. It's an in-house battle now. Clear? Now I'm getting angry right now. I'm actually getting angry. And I have to control myself because my brother David doesn't like it when I go on and rant and expose these opinions of these scholars. And guys, don't take my word for it. Can you do me a favor? Don't take my word for it. I want you to go on Facebook or get their email. Ask Daniel Wallace, Mike Lacona, Craig Evans. Say, can I ask you a question? Don't attack them. Don't fight with them because you're not going to win the argument. Just ask them. In the Gospel of John, does John give us the actual words of Jesus so that Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am? See what they're going to tell you. When Jesus says, I thirst in John 19, 28, did he actually say that? You know what they're going to tell you? John is not giving you the words of Jesus. So if you had a tape recorder and you went around recording Jesus, he wouldn't say the things that John records because John is interpreting Jesus for us. He's telling us what Jesus means. Don't take my word for it. Ask them. Don't challenge them. Don't debate. Just ask them. Let them tell you. So you're going to hear it from the horse's mouth. Because you're not going to convince them. They're already convinced. And who are you to convince them? You're not a scholar. You don't have a PhD. You're not on my level. You're just a fundamentalist, a fanatic. Okay. I'll see you before the great white throne of Jesus. No, he didn't first and last. John is giving you what he believed Jesus meant. Okay? So Jesus didn't really say, I am the way and the truth of life. He's just telling you that's what Jesus meant. No, I'm, being I'm not exaggerating. Folks, I know you're probably shocked you don't believe me. I'm not exaggerating. All right. With that said, are we ready now for the series? We're going to use the Jehovah's Witnesses' own perverted Bible to prove the Trinity that Jesus is God in the flesh. Thank the Lord. I thank the triune God. I didn't go to college. I didn't go to seminary. Either I would have been duped into following this, or I would have gotten into arguments and fights with my professors and been thrown out of the school. Thank God the Lord didn't allow me to go to Bible college or seminary. Because it's cemetery. Right? Okay, with that said, may the triune God be glorified. This is, remember, this is the first session, so I had to do a lot of uh, preparation, a lot of groundwork, laying the foundation, preparatory work, right? I hope you didn't mind. I hope it was educational. I hope it challenged you and it even upset you. Right? I believe that Norman Geisler was of the old camp. Norman Geisler believed that what John wrote were the words of Jesus. That's why Norman Geisler was a breath of fresh air. He was part of the old school apologist who still held to many traditional conservative views. So he was a blessing to the church. But the days of Norman Geisler, they're gone. Because what's replaced Norman Geisler are the Mike Laconas and the Craig Evans. In the days of Norman Geisler, you had men like Gleason Archer who would defend the historical accuracy of John and that Jesus said the things that John records Jesus is saying. We still have few of them. James White is one of them. 
What happens, Zina? I told you. We're going to start 445 your time. Hey, where are you at, sister? Anyway, right? James White is one of them. John MacArthur is one of them. John Piper is one of them. Robert Bowman Jr. is one of them. They still affirm. John wrote the words of Jesus. They still affirm. John wrote the words of Jesus. But Norm Geisler was a gift to the church because he still held to the old conservative views on gospel authorship, gospel composition, inerrancy of, of the Bible, and the historical accuracy of John. We lost the giant when Norm Geisler left us to be with Jesus. Yeah, Dave Hunt was another one. Dave Hunt, too, would tell you the gospel of John historically accurate. That John gave you the words of Jesus. Right. In fact, Norm Geisler was one of the people that went after Mike Lacona and exposed him. Because Mike Lacona, I don't know if you're aware of this, he started a lot of controversy. Mike Lacona says that the story in Matthew 27, 52 to 53 where it says the bodies of dead saints came to life when Jesus rose from the dead and showed themselves in the holy city. Mike Lacona questions whether that's historically accurate. He says it may not be history that Matthew's given us, but he's given us what he calls apocalyptic imagery. Did you know that? Norm Geisler went after him and said that view goes against inerrancy. If you deny that's historically accurate, then you're questioning the historicity of Matthew. You know what's sad, folks? You know what's sad? Oh, yeah. Do, Google it, Mike, Mickey Afrata. This is nothing new. You know what's sad, folks? Did you know that scholars like Craig Evans, even like a William Lane Craig, even Daniel Wallace, Paul Copan, took Mike Lacona's side over against Norm Geisler? Because one thing about the scholarly guild, there's a buddy system where they're all buddies. And they won't criticize each other publicly. They'll defend each other, even at the expense of the integrity of scriptures. But Norm Geisler was bold enough to call him out and ask him to step down. In fact, Norm Geisler was the reason that Mike Lacona lost his teaching job at one of the seminaries. Now, do you blame Norm Geisler? Or do you thank God for Norm Geisler? So I'm getting upset thinking about it. I should not think about it. I should not. See, if I keep talking about this, folks, I'm going to get angry and I'm going to upset. And guys, don't take my word for it. Put Norm Geisler, Mike Lacona, Matthew 27, 52 to 53. And because of the influence of Mike Lacona and others, guess what? You know what they call that story now by way of mockery? The zombie apocalypse. Folks, don't believe me. Can you do me a favor? Here, first to last, I want you to go on YouTube right now. I want you to put Mike Lacona. Zombie apocalypse and see what you find and share the link. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, thank you. All right. I don't know much about Jacob Prash, but from what I gather, I hear he's one of those old school conservatives that he too is like a Norman Geisler. If you have one of those old school conservatives, TB, who say that John gave you the words of Jesus, the actual words of the historical Jesus, that man, say praise God for him. Here's the litmus, litmus test, TB uh, James. Any scholar that tells you John is not giving you the words of Jesus, but he's giving you the meaning of Jesus, you know that man's been compromised. But if you have someone saying, no, when Jesus says, I am the Father one, the historical Jesus said it. Jesus said those words. And John is accurately recording them by inspiration. Praise God for that man. He's old school, meaning he belongs to the older conservative scholars because the scholars today sound like the liberals. Don't know much about Walter Veith apart from that he's King James only. And I think he's a seven-day Adventist. So, okay, everyone with me so far? Shamir Suleiman, yeah, there's outstanding books. Get Gleason Archer's Encyclopedia Bible Difficulties. Even Craig Blomberg's Defense of the Historical Reliability of the Gospels and, and John, excellent. 
But remember, separate the wheat from the chaff. Don't take everything they say as gospel truth. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. And this is what your prayer should be. Now, let me encourage you to pray this way. From now on, you need to pray for your conservative scholars who still affirm traditional views of the Bible, like the historical accuracy of the Gospel of John. So bathe me in prayer and others that hold to the same views, right? And I want you to pray this prayer every night. Holy Spirit, pray it in your own way. Just give you an idea of how to pray. Holy Spirit, you are truly God Almighty. You are real. You are life. You are reality. One with the Father and the Son. And you've been sent by Jesus to preserve the church, to guide the church, to perfect the church, and seal the church for the glory of Jesus. And you are our perfect teacher. I yield to you completely. Fully own me, possess me, and fill me. Take possession of every part of my being. And you teach me the truth and save me from all error because my trust is in you and you alone because you alone are the perfect teacher. And I love you and I worship you. Please, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. That's what I pray. That's been my prayer for years. And I pray, I pray that prayer till I die or until the Lord comes. Is that clear now? Sam and Adventist told you, ah, forget about that. Thank you guys for your support. Now let's begin. This was a very lengthy introduction, but I hope that it blessed you, challenged you, and helped you to see don't make scholars more than they are. Don't be fascinated by anyone, even me, and I mean that, by me. I'm nothing. Don't be fascinated with David Wood. Don't be fascinated with Christian Prince. Don't be fascinated with Mike Lacona or Daniel Wallace or Chris. Be fascinated with the triune God. Be fascinated with the Holy Spirit. Completely, perfectly yield to the Holy Spirit. Trust in him, love him, and never doubt him. Okay? That's who you need to be fascinated with. So, Lord willing, let's finish part one. I'll give you some some. Ways of using the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity and that Jesus is God in the flesh. Okay. Okay. So, guys, I mean it from my heart. Let me say it again. I just feel moved in my spirit. Out of my love for Jesus, first and foremost, because I love him, I love you because of him. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. Why would I waste my time? And because I love Jesus, let me repeat it again. I feel like I need to repeat it. And I pray that's from the Spirit moving me as I yield to the Spirit. Don't trust. Don't trust any human authority completely, wholeheartedly, especially me. Never make any of us more than they are. And don't quote us as if we are inspired authors of the Bible. Don't. Don't. Trust any human authority on this side of eternity completely. Question all of us. Perfectly yield to the trying God. Perfectly yield to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Perfectly yield to the Spirit and day and night say, Holy Spirit, please. Jesus said he would send you to guide the church into all truth. And that you would enable the disciples to perfectly recall the words of Jesus and preserve those words for future generation of believers. My trust is in you, Holy Spirit. You are my teacher, my God, my Lord, my love, my life, my Savior, my Redeemer, my preserver, my all in all. I yield to you. Please save me from all sin and all error. And guide me to those teachers and only accept from those teachers what's from you. Please, Holy Spirit. See, I want to emphasize this. That's been my prayer. Okay. Now, let me show you that in Scripture. John 14, 26. Amen. It is. Better to trust the Lord. John 14, 26. Even from the Jehovah Witness Bible. I don't care.
Russo, I just want to have enough money where I don't have to worry about all these debts and that my girls are taken care of and that I can raise them up to be godly women. That's it. I'm not looking to be honestly, I'm not. But also, I don't want to be begging people. I don't want to be a beggar of men. I want to beg my God for my daily bread. It is sometimes troubling and disheartening when you're often having to make appeal to people to support the ministry because I don't like to do that. I wish I was rich so I can just not ask for support. And yet you have these people, these scholars who are making top dollar and doing more damage than good. Isn't that sad? Anyway, John 14, 26. Okay, John 14, 26. Read. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, that one will teach you all things and bring back to your minds all the things I told you. Let's repeat that one more time. One more time. Amen, Don. Only trust the triumph God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Guys, read this. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, that one will teach you all things and bring back to your minds all the things I told you. You see, the Holy Spirit will do that. Trust in him. John 16, 12 to 13. Anthony Caputi, be patient. Hold your horses. We're going to get to that passage. Just be patient, brother. Don't try to impress us with your knowledge. And this is in the Jehovah Witness Bible, October 31st. John 16, 12 to 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. However, when that one comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but what he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things to come. How can you not perfectly, completely trust the Holy Spirit? See what Jesus said? He will guide you into all the truth. And he will only repeat to you what he hears from me and the Father. So you need to yield completely to the Spirit. Are you catching it here? Who guides us into all truth, Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Who will remind us of your words? And perfectly so, the Holy Spirit. Will the Holy Spirit say anything that's not from you? Never. The Holy Spirit will only speak what I send him to say. You see why? Your trust is not in me, David Wood, Vocab Malone, any of these teachers, but in the Holy Spirit of the living God. So let's go to Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Man, my phone is blowing up. Guys, be patient, man. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Read with me what Jesus says. But you do not be, do not you be called rabbi. Now I'm going to explain what he means here. He's talking to the disciples. You don't call yourselves rabbi, for one is your teacher, and all of you are brothers. And he's talking to the disciples, the apostles, okay? Moreover, do not call anyone your father on earth, for one is your father, the heavenly one. Neither be called leaders, for your leader is one, the Christ. Now, if you read the context, we don't have to, time to read the context, but to so understand what Jesus meant. He's talking about the scribes, the religious authorities, the teachers of the law. He says they sit in the seat of Moses, so do what they tell you, but don't do what they do. Pay attention to what he's saying here. When they read the law of Moses, do it, but don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. And so what Jesus is saying here is do not. Give wholehearted, perfect allegiance to any human teacher. You only give wholehearted, perfect allegiance to the Father and to me, Jesus Christ, his son. You never question anything the Father says or I say. Anything we say, you accept wholeheartedly. But don't you give such allegiance, devotion, and obedience to anyone else but the Father and I, Jesus Christ. You understand what he's saying here? So never look to any guy as infallible and completely reliable who will always speak the truth. Never. The only one who is infallible will always speak the truth and will never mislead you and never be in error is the Father and his Son and his Holy Spirit. Only so if you know if it comes from the Father's mouth, have no doubt, accept it. If you know it comes from Jesus, 
Have no doubt, accept it. And if you know it's from the Spirit, have no doubt, accept it. Anyone, everyone else, question. Question. Anyone else? You get it? Your bishops, your priests, your cardinals, and definitely the Pope with all the corruption and falsehood that he's not promoting. Your pastors, your deacons, apologists, evangelists, all of them except the trying God. Clear? Is that clear? Is it sinking in? Before I move on? Okay. If now this prepared you for the series, are you guys excited? Who said uh, I'd be offended? I just told you, Angela. You need to practice discernment with me. But what do I say? Don't debate me. Don't fight me or challenge me. First, hear what I have to say. Go back and listen to what I said. Examine it and ask the Spirit to show you where I'm wrong and to save you from those errors and convict me not to repeat those errors. All I ask you is don't fight me or don't debate me. Just hear it out. Here's my case. All right. I don't agree with you here, Sam. All right. Keep that between you and the Lord. If I'm wrong, may the Lord show me. Just don't fight me and debate me about it because we're not going to get anywhere. You challenge me. I'm not going to be listening. Because my aim will be to refute you, and that's not what you want, right? That's why I can listen to people who I don't always agree with. And I listen to all they say, and I meditate, and I say, well, here's where he's wrong. I don't accept that. And he may be right, but on my level, I see that he's wrong. And there has to be some humility and humbleness on the part of every one of us. You may think the gentleman is wrong, but that assumes that you are on a level of spiritual maturity to know he's wrong, it may be you're not mature enough to see he's right, so you think he's wrong. You with there? Sometimes when I say this guy's wrong, it's because I'm assuming I've attained a level of spiritual maturity to know he's wrong. But what if I'm immature and not aware that I am immature, so in my immaturity I think he's wrong when I'm actually wrong? See, but that's the work of the Holy Spirit again. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He has to show you, no, Sam, you were wrong, not him. You were too immature to see it. Now I'm convicting you to see your error and repent of it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I need you, Holy Spirit, for that reason. Right? Psalm 143.10. Psalm 143.10. Oh, there we go, the prophet of Muhammad. Look what it says here. Look what David says. Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will. Pay attention, Rousseau. Look at it. Jehovah Witness Bible. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. May it lead me on level ground. You see, even the psalmist knows I need your spirit because he is perfectly good, and he will guide me on the straight path. Your spirit who is good, I need him. I need him. KBI, let me just share this real quick as a glory to the Holy Spirit. Early on, I became aware, early on, I became aware that I was able to recall Bible verses on any topic that someone would ask me without taking notes, without memorizing the Bible. That is truly a gift from God. He gets the glory, may perfect that gift in me to use it to glorify Christ. So when he say notes, it's I I didn't do this from notes, right? Even in 1999, Mickey, I was able to recall passages. So this wasn't something that took 20 years. Right when I started full-time ministry, passages would come to me. Boom, 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 boom. And I have recessions and recordings from 1999, then 2000, where without notes, I would just recall the verses because that was God's gifting to enable me to teach. So he gets the glory for that. So when you ask me how I do it, I didn't try to do it. I didn't follow any method to do it. It was just God's gifting. So he gets the glory. Right? So just wanted to say that. With that said, let's do at least 10 minutes of how to use the Jehovah Witness Bible. 
How to use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity. Are we ready? Are we ready? I'm actually writing an article on this. This is part one of a multi-part series, folks. So let's see. How do, what should I start with? Yeah, I'm going to have to keep it simple. Okay, I'm going to just do one from Revelation. He gets the glory. Uh, Immortal Bomb. You know I'm going to block you right after I answer your question. Immortal Bob, because you are a stupid ignoramus. Because the Apostle Paul used the writings of Greek pagans to prove the truth of Christ. So are you better than Paul, more inspired than Paul, and more Christian than Paul was? Immortal Bob? Hold on, because we got another idiot, some stupid ignoramus, who thinks he's being Christ-like. No, 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 no. You just insulted me, Immortal Bob. Let me just show you why. You, here, look look what you just said. No, it wasn't a genuine question. You attacked. Here. Don't play games now that I called you out. Is it strange to use a satanic book to prove Christ? If you wanted to know, you would have asked, Brother, is it biblical to use even the sources of unbelievers to prove the truth of the faith? See, that's asking. But you just accused me of using something satanic to prove the truth of Christianity. And you see why I get upset? This is why I get upset with too many chiefs who want to pontificate and not Indians who want to listen. Okay, Immortal Bomb, let me tell you some rules here so you can benefit. Don't ever, ever pontificate. Be humble enough to ask me why I'm using this approach. And I'll give you my reasons biblically. And if you still reject my approach, more power to you. But to come and attack and say, hey, isn't it strange to use a, a satanic book to prove that the... Endear yourself to me. That's another thing, folks. Let me repeat one more time. Let me repeat one more time. Don't challenge me here. Don't debate me here. Don't attack me here. Hear what I got to say. Go back and prayerfully look over it. If you think I'm wrong, between you and the Lord. I thought I just said that. I thought I just said that. So, mortal bomb. The Lord have mercy on you and me. And may the Lord give me grace to be patient with you as he's patient with me. I'm going to assume you meant well. Yes, the Bible shows us that we can use the writings, the sources, of even the people that we're witnessing to, to prove the truth of the Christian faith. Even if those sources are written by pagans and idolaters. Yes, that's in the Bible. Now, let me give you an example. One example for the sake of time. Acts 17, verse 28. Andrew K., you're talking to me? You want me to muzzle you too for being a stupid brain ass? Make my day, Andrew. I'm not here to tickle ears, but to muzzle, bring asses like you. So you're attacking me? Get out of here. I didn't ask you to come. Get him out of here. Go to Mike Lacona. He's nicer. Okay. Acts 17, 28. For by him we have life and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. Paul is talking to the Greeks, pagans who had idols. And he says, even one of your own poets realizes God is our father. He's quoting a Greek pagan poet to prove the truth of the gospel. Did you get that, immortal Bob? Did, did you, are you paying attention? Listen, forget about the apologies. Did you see what Paul just did? He quoted a Greek pagan poet. To prove the truth that God is our father and we are his children. To prove the truth that God is our father and we are his children. Did you see it or no? One more time. Acts 17 verse 28. Okay, Immortal Bomb. God bless you. It's okay. But you didn't answer my question. Did you see the verse, Immortal Bob? Focus, Immortal Bob. Focus. Do you see Paul is quoting... A Greek pagan poet to prove that God is our father. We are his children. 
All human beings are created by God, sustained by him. So in that sense, he's the father of us all. That's okay, mortal bomb, but you got it now. So to answer your question, can I use the Quran or the Vedas or the Buddhist scriptures or the writings of the Greek poets and the pagans, Aristotle, Plato, to make a point about the truth of Christianity? Absolutely yes. Paul did it, and he was spirit-filled, inspired by God, who gave us half the New Testament under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You're not more spiritual. You're not more spirit-filled than Paul. And that's just one verse. I prefer to use Jehovah, Anthony, right? But you're asking me, when you have time, should our Protestant Bibles use? Yes, it should. And actually, Anthony, in the Old Testament, they should have retained the name of God as Yehovah or Jehovah. Even if I want to go with Yahweh, that's fine. They should have, but they didn't. Another topic for another time. Okay, so is that clear, mortal bomb? I love you, brother, for the sake of the Lord. Please know how to approach matters. Don't be confrontational because I promise you, you will learn a lot and benefit a lot by the grace of God's spirit in these sessions if you know how to approach these matters. I don't want you to blindly believe in me. And I'm going to repeat it again because I think people don't believe me when I say it. I don't want blind puppets and followers. I don't want fans. God forbid I ever encourage people to be a fan of mine. God forbid, because you know what a sign of a true teacher is? And I'm praying that I'm a true teacher anointed by the Spirit. Make you passionate, sold out disciples of Christ. A teacher brings you to Christ, not to himself. A teacher is used by the ultimate perfect teacher of the Spirit to make you passionately fall in love with Jesus and be sold out for Jesus, never bringing you to himself. And I pray I am that kind of teacher and never bring you to myself. Please, Lord, don't let me do that. Please, Lord. Please. And I mean that from my heart. Okay? So, help me to help you. Don't fight me. Don't debate me. Don't challenge me. Hear me out. Go back. And if you don't think I'm right, that's fine. Hey, I listen to Leighton Flowers, Gregory Boyd. William Lane Craig, to Catholic apologists like Trent Horn. I listen to all of them. I don't agree with all of them, but I listen. And I study their points, and I say, oh, here's where he's wrong. Now, that's a bad argument. Here's where he's good. I don't need to fight them. Let me hear what they got to say and go back and study. Can you at least do that with me? It's okay, immortal bomb. Don't get sensitive. God bless you and preserve you. You're my brother. That's it. Don't worry about it. It's done. It's okay. Forgive me, it's done. Okay, is that clear? Chris Dino, the best thing to do is William Lane Craig's debates with atheists, as well as Greg Bonson, his debates with atheists, John Lennox, his debate with Richard Dawkins, as well as James White's debate with atheists. Let them watch those debates, and if they still don't believe in God, then that means it's not because of evidence. It's because their hearts are hardened. Because these Christians decimate the atheists, providing irrefutable proof that they even know God exists, but they want to submit to him. William Lane Craig, Reasonable Faith. He's got a YouTube channel, over 100 debates. Even Greg Bonson, who passed away, who debated atheists, his debates. John Lennox with Richard Dawkins. James White's debates with atheists. Anyway, with that said, come on. We got to go into at least one argument using their Bible to prove Jesus is Jehovah. See here again, where are we at? Love and trust Jesus. Love and trust Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? I'm not putting Catholic apologists in the same camp. Here we go again. Okay. Christian Prince, he listens to Muslims. David Wood listens to Muslims, even atheists. Anthony Rogers listens to Muslims and atheists. Now, can you explain to me why are they listening to Muslims and atheists? How do you answer this question? And I'm not putting Catholics in the same category. Don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand me. 
No, it's not just to better love them. It's to understand what they're thinking, what they're saying, and what they believe. So wait, you're telling me a Catholic apologist has nothing to say that can benefit you? Nothing? Because Catholicism has no truth whatsoever? Completely devoid of all truth? Really, love and trust? So that means the virgin birth must be a lie because Catholics believe it. The Trinity must be a lie because Catholics believe it. The resurrection of Jesus must be a lie because Catholics believe it. Christ dying on the cross for our sins must be a lie. Catholics believe it. Do you see why I got upset with your question and why I say some of these questions are so stupid that they're insulting? You understand why I get upset, folks? Why as I get older, I get more upset, less patient because I cannot tolerate this? So notice your stupid logic. If a Catholic apologist teaches it, it's got to be false because that's the implication of your question. I don't know if you realize it. Why would you listen to them? So if a Catholic apologist does a, a, a talk on the Trinity and gives one of the best defenses of the Trinity, I shouldn't listen to that. He's a Catholic apologist. Do you see why I get upset with such stupidity? So if a Catholic apologist or scholar makes a solid historical case for the Shroud of Turin being the actual burial shroud of Jesus preserved as a testimony by God to the resurrection as a fact of history, because some of the best defenders of the Shroud of Turin being the Shroud of Jesus are Catholics. But because it's Catholic, it's a lie. Oh, but wait. Catholics believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are inspired revelations of the Holy Spirit. That's a lie. Let's start reading the Quran. Do you see why that statement is so stupid? It insults me. It upsets me. You guys see it or no? Do you see it or no? This is why you guys are going to remain mediocre and you're not going to grow spiritually and intellectually because you're afraid to listen to a broad range of scholarship, even with voices you don't agree with, to at least be challenged. How are you going to at least, at, at least if you want to witness to a Catholic and show them, that here's the gospel that the Bible teaches, not the gospel you believe in. How if you don't know what their gospel is? How if you don't know what passages they point to to prove their gospel is correct and yours is wrong? How? So now notice the stupid response. Love and trust Jesus, you got to get out of my, get out of my channel. Get out of here. Don't ever come back. Get her out of here. Caution is never stupid. Don't ever come back. I don't need people like this. Okay? Sorry about that. Sorry, folks. Can't I can't handle this. This channel is not for everyone. I hope you understand that, right, Marcy and everyone? This channel is not for everyone. It's only for those who can handle it. Sorry. I'm not going to draw everyone to myself. My personality is different. Just like David Wood turns many people off and turns many people on. That's just how it is. Anyway, with that said, let's come back. Wasted time on something stupid. Caution is never stupid. You see how stupid and insulting belittling that was to me? Because that means I'm not cautious. I'm an ignoramus. I'm stupid. Okay. Yeah, the best way to be uh, gentle is don't say much and don't pretend to be gentle as a way of attacking me for not being gentle, pretending that you're more spiritual than me. And that way you'll be more gentle, not get blocked. Okay, obviously invisible, so remain invisible. Okay, now let's get back to the issue. Hopefully by tomorrow, by the grace of God, tomorrow, Lord willing, part two, we can then just go right into the meat of the matter. Right into the meat of the matter, right? We're just going to use the Joe Witness Bible to, believe, to prove the Trinity. Now, no, notice what Shani just did. We're going to talk about using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity. Who are the two olive witnesses of Revelation? 
Uh, Shawnee, I think it's probably your mother and father. Ever think about that? Maybe they're the two witnesses. Yep, there goes that demon again, and there another Nick, and then Arafal. All right. Now, let's come back to the issue. Are we ready now? Are we seriously ready or no? Are we seriously ready? <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready? Are you sure? Because I got to at least make one point, one point from the Jehovah Witness Bible that Jesus is a Jehovah God. You sure? Okay. Let's go to Revelation 1, verse 8. Revelation 1, verse 8. Lord willing, tomorrow, part two, the entire session, God willing, tomorrow, part two, the entire session, listen to what I'm saying, Lord willing, tomorrow, part two, the entire session will be devoted just using the Joe Witness Bible to prove the Trinity. Today, I'm just going to give you one because I had to lay the groundwork, the foundation for the series. So I hope you don't mind. I took over an hour to lay the groundwork, the foundation, the issues that we're all confronted with all the challenges, all right? Okay, Revelation 1.8. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. So, number one, side note, I forgot to mention this. Let's post Revelation 1.8 again. Revelation 1.8 again. I forgot to mention this. Thank the Lord we went to this passage. And here's the link to the Jehovah Witnesses Bibles. Here it is. Guys, save the link. Use their resources. And they, uh, uh, unbelievably, side note, to confirm what I'm saying, you know, Joe's Witnesses have some great articles proving the historical accuracy of the Bible, the preservation of the Bible, and the supernatural divine origin of the Bible. They actually have great articles, free of charge, showing you the archaeological historical proof for the Bible's historical accuracy and its preservation and fulfilled prophecy as proof that the Bible is God's word. So you can even use this corrupt organization and some of their arguments to strengthen your case for the accuracy of the Bible and its inspiration. See, you can even learn from them. That's what I'm trying to say. It's amazing, man. Okay, here. Guys, save this link. Save this link. You got to use their Bibles because I'm going to share something with you in Revelation 1.8. Watch here. Revelation 1 verse 8. Okay. This was all groundwork. Laying the foundation, preparatory. I am the Alpha and Omega, says Jehovah God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. Guys, this is something you need to remember. Etch this in your mind and your heart. Don't forget this by the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Jehovah Witnesses inserted the word Jehovah in the New Testament 237 times, even though the word Jehovah doesn't appear a single time and the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Did you know that? They changed the Greek word for Lord into Jehovah 237 times without any basis to do so. No, Enuni, don't use that argument. Please don't. Don't make it harder for me because I have to correct that mistake. In Revelation, it's not just Jesus who's coming. The Father's coming with him. Please, Enuni, don't pontificate. Just listen. Because you're going to embarrass yourself if you run into the right Jehovah Witness who's going to quote the verse to refute you. Trust me. Listen. Okay. Let me try it again. Let me try it again. One more time. The Jehovah Witnesses inserted the word Jehovah 237 times in the English translation of their New Testament, even though the word Jehovah doesn't appear a single time in the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Do you know that? Are you listening to this point? You got to get this point. 237 times the society inserted the word Jehovah in their English translation of the New Testament, even though the word Jehovah doesn't appear a single time in the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. They simply made it up. And here, let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you by showing you their own Greek, their Greek interlinear. Let me prove it to you. Hold on. Let me get there. Here's their Greek interlinear free of charge online. Thank God for modern technology to make our job easier. Here you go. 
Click on it. There you go. Click on it. Guys, do you see? If you look at their interlinear, here's what it says. I'm going to read the English translation of their interlinear. I am the Alpha and the Omega is saying, Lord the God. There is no Jehovah there. It's Kyrios, Kurios, Hatheos. The one being and the one was and the one coming, right? The Almighty. Here's their own Greek interlinear. And you guys see, you don't need to read the Greek, Mickey. They provide it in English. Just look at the English, man. It's an interlinear. That's why it's called interlinear. Can you guys click on it and confirm for yourself? The word Jehovah is not even in the Greek that they use. Even the Greek that they use does not have the word Jehovah. It has the word Lord. Do you know why they inserted the word Jehovah 237 times in their English New Testament? Why would it need to be in Hebrew when it's from Latin, Proverbs, Proverbs? Your argument is, again, a very stupid one. I'm sorry. Do you know why? There's a difference between retaining a Latin translation of a Hebrew word in English and simply inserting the word Jehovah in the New Testament when it's never used a single time. Why would you even use that argument, Proverbs, Proverbs? Why are you insulting my intelligence again? Lucifer comes from the Latin translation of the Hebrew Hillel. So to retain the Latin translation of a Hebrew word, that's fine. But to insert a word that doesn't appear in any version of the New Testament, not just the Greek, why are you comparing apples and pineapples? Hillel, Hillel, not Hillel, Hillel. The Latin translated Isaiah 14, 12, Hillel, as Lucifer. That's why it's in your King James, because they took it from the Latin. This is what happens when you want to be a chief again. You see the chiefs? Here, let me impress you with my knowledge, and then you embarrass yourself. This is where the humbleness comes in, and just listen. So we confirm, right? The Greek New Testament of the Jehovah's Witnesses does not use the word Jehovah. The reason why they insert the word Jehovah is to separate Jesus from being Jehovah. After all, if you're a Jehovah Witness and you read Revelation 1.8 and you see the word Jehovah, guess what you're going to think? That's referring to the Father. It can't be Jesus. You see the indoctrination, how they are indoctrinating their followers by inserting the word Jehovah in the English New Testament in places in which it's clearly Jesus, but they want to confuse their followers and to thinking it can't be Jesus, it must be the Father, because only the Father is Jehovah. You see what they're doing? Marcy, are you learning a lot today? I hope you learned a lot today. I hope you learned a, a lot. You see what they did? By inserting the word Jehovah in Revelation 1.8, a Jehovah Witness is going to tell you that's the Father. And if you say it's Jesus, say, no, it's not Jesus. That's the Father. Why? Because only the Father's Jehovah. And here it says Jehovah. So it's got to be the Father. It's not Jesus. See the indoctrination? See the brainwashing? See the deceit? Right? You see the indoctrination? You see the brainwashing? You see the deceit? Clear? Okay. With that said... With that said, let's go back again. Revelation 1.8. Because I'm going to just, for argument's sake, grant their, their, their point. I'm going to argue. Okay, that's Jehovah. Pay attention here. Okay, now send Proverbs, Proverbs, this, this barking dog on his merry way. He's another dog that's pontificating. Okay, Revelation 1.8. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God. The one who is and was, who is to come, who is coming, the Almighty. Now, number one. Here's how you don't witness to a Jehovah Witness. Pay attention. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to answer questions. And they're also taught, guys, please give me your attention. I need you to, because I'm trying to help you. Do you want to see Jehovah's Witnesses get saved? Do you want the Spirit to use you to bring Jehovah's Witnesses to the truth? Please listen. Please listen. Okay? Please listen. Like Anthony Caputi, can't be patient. I think I'm going to block this guy because he keeps chiming in. 
We're going to get to John 1.1 1, 1 and Colossians 1. He's trying to impress me with his knowledge. See, a God, Anthony, do you want to stay or do you want me to send you on your merry way? Okay, listen now. Too many chiefs, guys. You see, they can't listen. Let me impress you. See, I know in their Bible, they inserted the word other four times and it's say, guys, see, look, I'm cool. I know my stuff. <laughs> okay. Let's come back to the issue. Okay, listen to what I'm about to tell you. The Joe witnesses are taught. The Joe's witnesses are taught. Listen. This Bible is only for the 144,000. The 144,000, the anointed class. They believe there are two classes of people, right? The little flock, the 144,000 anointed, right? the anointed class, and the great crowd. This Bible was only written for the 144,000, the anointed class. Only they know what it means. Only they can interpret it. Only they can understand it because only they have Holy Spirit to understand this book. It's written for them. That's why you need the 144,000 and you need the, the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses to tell you what it means. So if you're not part of the anointed class, you're not part of 144,000, you can't understand what this means. You can't understand what this means. Are you listening? So you need the anointed class to tell you. Since you're not a Jehovah's Witness, you're not even part of the great cloud, let alone, you know, the little flock. Therefore, you cannot possibly know what it means. So when you tell a Jehovah's Witness, this is what it means. They're trained to shut you shut you out. They're trained. This man is of the devil. He's part of corrupt Christendom. He's not a Joe witness, so he can't possibly know what it means because he's not part of the anointed class, so they shut you down. They don't listen. They're trained to shut you out. So the worst way to witness to a Jehovah witness is to tell them, here's what this passage means. It's over. They won't listen to you. So do you really want to win them to Christ? You never tell them what a passage means. You ask questions. Because I've been in their meetings and they're taught, answer questions. So you tell them, hold on. Since only Jehovah is the Alpha and the Omega, and Jesus is not Jehovah but a creature, then how can he call himself the Alpha and Omega? I'm confused. I'm confused. And then make a strong case that Jesus claims to be Alpha and Omega so they can't get around it. And that's how you plant the seeds or water seeds and you put a dent and the spirit will now start pounding them because now they're going to start thinking about it. Yeah. Why did Jesus say that? I'm baffled. That's how you do it. So if you tell them what it means, they shut you out because you're not part of the anointing class. They'll tell you, ask a Jehovah's Witness. Don't take my word for it. I've been told that the Bible was written for the anointed class. Only they can interpret it correctly. They'll say yes. Only them. So you can't tell them what it means. So do you want really want to be effective? Never tell them this is what it means. Ask them. Wait, I'm confused. How can this be so? What about this passage? And keep asking them. And once you've made a point and you ask them, don't go after it and put them on the defensive where they think now you're asking to attack because then they're going to shut you out. Let it go and go to another point. Let it go and go to another point. You get my point? Once I show clearly Jesus is Alpha and Omega and I see how stupid their response is, I'll say, okay, leave it alone. Come back with another question. And that's how you do it, slowly but surely chip away by the power of the Holy Spirit by asking enough questions that now those questions are implanted in mind their hearts and they can't escape it. You with me there? Everyone there? You understand how not to witness to them? Matthew, focus on the topic, please. Okay, now, with that said, Revelation 1 8. Revelation 1 8.
That's not where I'm going at, Mickey Efrata. See, you didn't, you're not following me either. I'm not going to first and the last. That's not my argument. So you're not paying attention either, brother. Pay attention, Mickey. I'm not using first last because I know how they answer that one. And it's not that he's the first one created, but that's why that's the one I'm avoiding. Okay, listen to Revelation 1 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God, the one who is and was and who is coming, the Almighty. So get them to agree. Say, so the Alpha Omega is only Jehovah, right? Only Jehovah is the Alpha and Omega. They'll say yes. Only Jehovah is the Alpha and Omega. Yes. Can a creature be Alpha and Omega? They'll say absolutely not. All right. Revelation 21, 6 to 7. It's not even the Almighty, first and last. We're not even going there. But yes, only Jehovah is the Almighty. Get them to say yes, only Jehovah is the Alpha and Omega, because they'll say yes. Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Revelation 21, 6, 7. Eli, do me a favor, Eli, Eli. When they come, ask them, say, I've been told the Bible was written for the anointed class, 144,000, only they can interpret it. Am I right? They'll say yes. Okay, Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Matthew, why are you going on tangents and talking about things? Focus on this for your benefit so you can learn from it. I don't know what happened to Protestant. Did he disappear? Did he leave, leave us behind? First last, we need Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Do, 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 do. Okay, read with me. Jehovah Witness Bible. And he said to me, they have come to pass. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To anyone thirsting, I will give from the spring of the water of life free. Anyone conquering will inherit these things, and I will be his God. He'll be my son. So they'll tell you this is the father. I will be his God. He'll be my son. So who's saying I'm Alpha and Omega beginning and end? They'll say, oh, that's Jehovah God the Father. And only Jehovah God can be Alpha and Omega beginning and end, right? They'll say yes. So you with me so far? Number one, prove Jehovah God is Alpha and Omega. Okay? Prove Jehovah God is Alpha and Omega. Only Jehovah God can be Alpha and Omega. Okay, now go to John 5, 22. John 5, 22. John 5, 22. Guys, I promise you, I'm not lying to you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you follow this way of arguing, you will rock their foundation. Rock their foundation. Now, Leon, instead of focusing on the topic, he's now hung up on the 144,000. Who cares who the 144,000 is? That's what they believe. Who cares how they arrive at that? Okay, John 5, 22. For the Father judges no one at all, but he has entrusted all the judging to the Son. Did you catch it? Ask them. Is Jesus clear that he is coming to judge and he alone will judge and not the Father? The Father is not the one who's going to judge, right? Because he says the Father judges no one. Only the Son is judging, right? Let's look at it again, John 5, 22. I don't know what happened to Protestant believer. He took a break. Would you take a vacation in Hawaii? No, Bill Thompson, I'm not. This is a method I learned from them. I haven't finished Coco's book. I just got it a couple weeks ago and I haven't even... Begun to get close to finishing it. I learned this from the Joe's Witnesses, Bill Thompson. I learned it from going to their meetings. I used to go to their meetings to hear how they thought. But now pay attention. John 5, 22. For the Father judges no one at all. Guys, get them to see. Get them to see. The Father judges no one. Right? Is that clear? So who's doing all the judging? The Son. So who's going to judge? The Son. Not the Father, right? They have to say yes. Are you with me there? Do you see it in their Bible? The Father judges no one. So who's coming to judge? The Son. Right? I want to make sure you're getting it. So you know how to use the argument. Did you catch it? Right? They'll say yes. Okay. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Here's the knockout. Are you ready for the knockout? Are you ready for the annihilation? The nightmare? The disaster? Revelation 22, 12 to 13. What does that got to do with the son being dead? They don't believe he's dead. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. So Protestant, put down the pipe, son. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Guys, read. 
Look, I am coming quickly, and the reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. Who's coming to repay and judge? Jesus. So then who's speaking here? Look, I'm coming quickly. The reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. End of story. Game over. Jesus just claimed to be Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and the last. Game over. You can't get around this. You're done. Do you know why you're done? Because you just had them read John 5, 22. John 5, 20 says, The Father judges no one. He's given all judgment to the Son. So let's go to Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Let's look at it again. One more time. Watch here. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Look, I am coming quickly. The reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. Remind them of John 5, 22. Now that's Jesus, right? They have to say yes. Because remember, the Father's not going to judge. He's coming to judge. So who's coming to repay people, reward people? They'll say Jesus. But hold on. Can you explain to me why Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end? Why? You can't tell me it's not Jesus because he said the Father judges no one. I'm coming to judge. I'm coming to re repay. I'm coming to reward. So why did Jesus just say I'm the Alpha and Omega beginning and the end? So it's not just he claims to be first and last. He says I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The very words of Jehovah in Revelation 1.8 and Revelation 21, 6 to 7. That's not going to work with them, Leon. My friend, don't argue with me. That's going to end up backfiring against you because they're going to tell you Psalm 110, Daniel 7, Revelation 1. They'll say that that's Jesus being given authority. And in Revelation 1, 8, it's not Jesus, it's the Father. Trust me, Leon. I'm trying to give you the best arguments to use against the sharpest Joe's witnesses. Trust me, my brother. I know how they're going to answer you there. The one I gave you, they don't know how to answer. They're going to be tap dancing. Okay, but let's unpack this further. Are you ready? Let's unpack this further. Revelation 22, 12, 13, 16, and 20. Back to back. Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13, verse 16 and verse 20. Watch. Look, I am coming quickly. Pay attention. Look, I am coming quickly, that language. And the reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, number one, from verse 12 to 16, there is no change in the speaker. There is no break in the speaker. The same one speaking in 12 continues speaking in 16. Notice who's speaking. I, Jesus, sent my angel. But the one who was speaking started speaking in 12, and he said, look, I'm coming quickly. The reward is, uh, I give is with me to pay each one according to his work. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the beginning and I, Jesus. But now notice 20. The one who bears witness of these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Put Revelation 22, 12, and 20 back to back. Revelation 22, verse 12, and 20 back to back. Bessie, why are you asking me a question that has nothing to do with my topic? Do you believe I'm going to block you for that? Revelation 22, 12, and 20. Look, I am coming quickly. Pay attention to that language. I'm coming quickly, and the reward I give is with me to pay each one according to his work. The one who bears witness of these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. With John 5, 22 and this, end of story. End of story. Knockout. Adios, amigos.
Okay, but wait, we're not done yet with this. Are you you want more? Okay. Want more? Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what I need you to pay attention. Matthew Well, hold on. John 5:22, guys, pay attention. John 5:22, back to back with Matthew 16:27. Back to back with Revelation 22, 12 to 13. John 5, 22. Matthew 16, 27. <clears throat> Revelation 22, 12 and 13. Watch. Watch. For the Father judges no one at all. I even like their translation. No one at all. He judges no one. They can't get around that. But he has entrusted all the judging to the Son. I do all the judging. And notice Matthew 16, 27. Guys, pay attention to Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is come in the glory of his Father. So I, the Son of Man, come in the glory of my Father. So that's the Son of God. Son of Man is come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will repay each one according to his behavior. The Son of Man, the Son of God, will repay each one according to his behavior. Now compare. Look, I am coming quickly. The reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. Whoa, that's what Jesus just said in Matthew 16, 27. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. How in the world do you get out get around this? Yep, this is the New World Translation of the Bible, Scott. I'm using their Bible to prove the Trinity. How do you get around this? Read Matthew 16, 27 again. For the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he, the Son of Man, will repay each one according to his behavior. Revelation 22, 12, look, I am coming quickly, and the reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. How do you get around this fact that this is Jesus? No, Jesus is my God. That's not a good argument. Because in Revelation 12, 7, it says Michael has angels. Revelation 12, 7 says, Michael and Michael's angels. That's not going to prove your case, Jesus is my God. Listen to me. I'm giving you the best arguments that work. Guys, did you see how Matthew 16, 27 with John 5, 20, 22 made it even more super airtight and irrefutable? Who didn't see it? So let me ask you a question. John 5, 22 says, the father judges no one at all, but is given all judging to the son. So the son is the one who does all judging. Matthew 16, 27, Jesus says, he's the son of man who comes in the glory of his father with his angels, and he will repay everyone according to his work. That's what Jesus says he's going to do, to come and repay. He's coming to repay everyone according to his work. But Revelation 22, 12 says, behold, look, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to repay each one. I'm the Alpha and Omega, beginning and first and last. You're trying to tell me that Jesus Christ is not speaking Revelation 22, 12 to 13? Now, Daily Gripe, who's been here long enough, knows better. And Bessie, I don't know who she is, is following his lead. We're talking about the Joe's Witness Bible, and they keep talking about Greg Stafford. Now, Daily Grant, what should I do, brother? What should I do for your distraction and allowing Bessie to also be distracted to distract us? Do you want me to send you an autographed photo of uh, Greg uh, Stafford? Do you want me to fix you on a date with him, Daily Grant? Because you're so in love with him, do you want to propose? Bessie, I'll destroy him and your satanic God and you because you're a filthy dog of the devil. That's why he won't debate me. Daily Gripe, you want me to? I can't contact Greg. I'll email him and say, Daily Gripe wants to propose. He wants an autographed picture from you. What do you think, Daily Gripe? Because you're just fascinated with Greg. If I get you a picture of him, will you build, build, like burn candles and incense before his picture? I want to send you a picture, and then I want you to take a picture of yourself burning candles to his photo. We're talking about Joe's Witnesses, their Bible, and you're talking about Stafford and Stafford and Stafford and Stafford.
How do you answer Daily Gripe, who's a regular, who comes here, who's a supporter, who I love, but how do you answer this guy who keeps talking about Stafford and Stafford and Stafford and Stafford? Here, let me call Stafford. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. What's up, Craig? What's up, buddy? Even though you backed down from debating me like a coward, you know you're still my homie, right? Hey, Craig, you got to do me a favor, bro. I'm here on a live stream, and there's this guy, Daily Gripe. And man, this guy, he salivates over you. He's got posters in his room and he's burning incense to your picture. What do you say if I fix you up with this guy? He's not that good looking. You know, he's got warts on his face and he's kind of bald and he does have a belly. But I know you're gracious because as a Joe witness, you don't look externally, look internally. You want me to give you his number? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The guy can't get enough of you, bro. He's, in fact, your book, Joe's Witnesses, defended and answered to scholars and critics. He wants to add that as the 28th book of the New Testament. The dude is in love with you. He's sickening. I want to lay hands and bust his jaw and repent. Okay, I'll let him know. Hey, you're, you're on, buddy. He wants to meet you in Huntington Beach tonight. So, Daily Grape, are you going to stop being a distraction and stop talking about Stafford? Are you going to keep being a nuisance and talk about Stafford? What do you think? What do you think? Can you stop with Stafford or do I have to block you, brother? It's not the first time you mentioned Stafford. What do you think, bro? Anyway, coming back to the issue. Everyone else following with me? Everyone else following with me besides the distraction of Stafford? Did you get now? Was it clear, Revelation 22, 12 to 13, Jesus is the one speaking, saying, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the first last. Any doubt about it? Thank you, Vlad. Even though your name is scary, Vlad Dracula. Vlad, don't come to my house tonight because I have a cross in my window and I have garlic. Okay, Vlad Dracula? So I'm ready for you. Is that clear now? Did you get it? We got distracted, but you saw how irrefutable the connection is with Jesus. Can a Jehovah Witness honestly get around the fact that when you read John 5, 22, Matthew 16, 27, the Father judges no one at all. All the judging is entrusted to the Son. The Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will repay everyone according to what they've done. So that's Jesus coming to repay people with his reward. And then in Revelation 22, 12, 13, it says, look, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to repay everyone. I am the Alpha and Omega, beginning and first and last. How do you get around the fact that has to be Jesus, especially when in that same chapter, the same speaker goes on in verse 16 and says, I, Jesus, sent my angel. And then in 20, John says, the one who testifies to these things says, look, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Can you get around that? Can you get around that? Is it clear as day? Jesus claimed to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the first and the last. Titles that only Jehovah can claim. Is it clear or do you guys have doubts? I honestly, let me know. Was it really that clear? Because if you really understood the argument and it's really clear, now you know how to ask the right question to the Jehovah's Witness and rock them. And notice it's their Bible. This was from their Bible, their own Bible. You see how amazing Jesus is? That Jesus lives, he's almighty, that from heaven he's even left a witness of who he truly is in this corrupt version. That's how great and awesome Jesus is. Even in this book, he's left himself a witness. That's how amazing he is. So now let's end it with the final point for today. This is to whet your appetite for what's to come. I'm going to do a lot of series on this. If you guys are interested, thank you guys, all of you uh, super chatters. God bless you. You know who you are. Thank you. Lord willing, I'm going to do another session tomorrow. So are you guys excited for what's to come? You're going to kill several birds with one stone in this series. Number one, you're going to learn the biblical basis for the Trinity, clear, irrefutable proof 
God is the Trinity according to his word, the Bible. Number two, how to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible against them, right? Against them to bring them to the true God. I mean, I will destroy you, your father and mother, and Stafford on the same night. I challenge the coward. He won't debate me because he's a coward like you because his false God can't save him, Ernie. And you're a punk. Stop hiding behind his dress. You debate me and watch what I'll do to you, you child of the devil. Yes, baby. Okay, you guys ready now? So if you follow the series, you're going to learn how to interpret the Bible. The clear, irrefutable evidence from the Bible that God is a triune God, Jesus, Job, in the flesh. And how to use the Jehovah's Witness own Bible against them to get them saved. Because we want them saved. Amen? You're going to learn a lot on how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible, how to witness the Jehovah's Witnesses, how not to witness the Jehovah's Witnesses, what arguments you don't use, what arguments you will use. I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. So I'm getting excited now. I want to lay hands on somebody. Daily right, give me your address because I want to bust you up, sucker. Here. All right. Man, I'm getting animated. Woo! I'm excited. I'm excited, man. I hope you guys are excited too. Okay. Now let's end it for tonight. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Let's end it for tonight. Isaiah 40, verse 10. I like that. That's right, brother. Isaiah 40, verse 10. You ready? From the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Look, the sovereign Lord Jehovah will come. Guys, pay attention. Look, the sovereign Lord Jehovah will come with power. Guys, pay attention. Jehovah's Witness Bible. It's the sovereign Lord Jehovah who's coming with power. And his arm will rule for him. Look, his reward is with him. And the wage he pays is before him. Now, Protestant believer, post Isaiah 40, verse 10, with Matthew 16, 27, back to back. And we're done for tonight. I'm hyped too. I hope you guys were blessed. I hope you guys were challenged. I hope you guys were blown away. I hope you guys were excited. Daily gripe. That's why I'm going to lay hands on you, sucker. God bless you. Give me your address. I'm going to send you an autographed picture. He wants to date you. He says you're kind of cute. Your ears are kind of like sexy. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 10, and Matthew 16, 27. Guys, read with me. Read. For the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father. The Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay each one according to his behavior. Look, the sovereign Lord Jehovah will come with power, and his arm will rule for, rule for him. Look, his reward is with him, and the wage he pays is before him. What are you saying, Jesus? Why did you just take the words of Isaiah 40, verse 10, where Jehovah's coming with his reward to repay people, and you're saying, I am the Son of Man who is coming in the glory of my Father with my angels. My reward is with me to repay everyone according to what they've done. Why are you taking the words of Jehovah, Jesus, and applying it to yourself? Because in Matthew 16, 27, it's Jesus speaking. It's Jesus speaking. Why? Why are you talking this way? And folks, that was their Bible we just quoted. How many of you guys were blown away? God bless you, Alex. That was their Bible. How many of you guys were blown away by this? Their Bible. If you're blown away, Lord willing, I promise you, God willing, tomorrow, when we start the session, we're just going to go into the evidence. This first part, I had to lay the foundation, the groundwork, and explain the issues. So bear with me. You got to listen to this over again. Learn what the issues are, the do's and don'ts, and the challenges facing us as Christians, challenges even posed by people from our own camp. And God willing, tomorrow, the entire session will be using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity. Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit is a person. It's a series that I'll be doing over time, but here's where I need your prayers. God bless you. All you super chatters, God bless you. Folks, I truly mean this. I need you to fast and pray hard for this week. Here's why. February 10, February 19, I need miraculous protection and safety that nothing will happen against me to try to take me back against my will for a debt I don't owe. Pray that God will use the appellate court to fight for me and save me and my children 
to bless me financially, to remove this judge completely, this demon, so I'm free and at peace, and favor here, to settle here and start my life here, and I move into my new place, February 15th, pray that everything falls in place, I get good internet there, and I'll be doing regular shows at a regular time, God willing, once I'm settled, but I need a miracle. February 10th, February 19th can work against me. I'm tired of it. I need to be delivered so I can do this and serve you to make this channel blow up by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Pray for the provision. God bless you, you super chatters. Thank you. You who are contributing via Patreon, thank you. Without your support, I can't do this. I couldn't survive. God is moving your hearts to minister, minister to me and partner with me for his glory. He doesn't need me. You don't need me. We need him. And it is an honor to serve you. And this is for all of you, all you regulars, daily gripe, all of you. It is an honor for me to be your brother and your servant for the sake of Jesus. It brings me joy and love and blesses me to serve you and to minister to you and bless you and to see the Holy Spirit use my meager efforts to help you know God more truly, love him more passionately, and have no doubt the God of the Bible is real. Jesus is alive, and he is our life. We will live and die for him by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. Pray me out of this. Covenant with me next week, February 10, February 19. Miracle. Pray that the mother of my children will be broken. God will not let her at peace. She'll be miserable until she repents and be restored to Jesus, and I have my daughters. Pray. God removes that man. His name is Martin. Ask God, remove Martin from his children's life. He is not their father. He has no right in their life. We rebuke that in Jesus' name. Amen? Martin Simon Yaku. Martin Simon Yaku. That's his name. Pray, God, remove him. He is gone in Jesus' name. He cannot have authority in my children's life. Martin Simon Yaku. Thank you. I love you guys. He's gone. Amen? Sooner than later in Jesus' name. See you tomorrow, God willing. Look for me around. Look for me around 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, around that time. In Jesus' name. I love you guys. I mean it. Daily gripe, all of you guys. I love you guys. I mean it from my heart. I love you for the sake of Jesus. And even better, my love can't do anything for you. Jesus loves you, and that's what counts. I hope you're excited because I'm now hyped. I'm ready to beat someone up. Daily gripe, give me your address because I want to just smash your face in, baby. And then repent. Take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.